47. Welcome back to the Scott Gibson Show. I am Scott Gibson. Who else would I fucking be? Um, we're recording this on a Tuesday before it comes out. General release on a Wednesday. I've also, um, I'm realising, realising, I have, I have difficulty saying words with the letter R in it. Not to the level of Jonathan Wass. Well, not at that point. But things like temporarily. 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 <laughs> the train was temporarily delayed. So I'm struggling with words. I mean, I've had brain surgery, for God's sake. I have had brain sur- surgically to th- surgical to the brain. Surgery to the brain. I can't fucking speak. It's mad to think that uh, a, a man, a gentleman, or a, or a lady, you know, I don't know who was present in the room at the time, but somebody said that somebody's been in my brain, man. You know? It's fucking mental to think. Anyway, episode 47, welcome back. Thank you, as always, to the rascals um, for joining the Patreoni. We had some good numbers uh, sign up last week. Uh, It's the best way to support the show. It's the only way to get every single episode and all the extra content, including, 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 including (laughs) comedy albums, uh, comedy specials and everything else that's coming out, all the good stuff uh, is on Patreon. So if you want to support the show, if you want to become a rascal on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash Big Scott Gibson. I'll go to the website, scottgibsoncomedy.co.uk and follow all the links on there. Good. Right. Um, 47. Hurtling towards 50. Eh? The half century. We've got the anniversary coming up as well. I think October the 7th um, is the one year anniversary of the show. So we'll need to think about something to do for that. Um, also mad... I can remember the very first episode that I recorded in the old flat in Edinburgh, uh, looking out the bay window as the, the office, the desk, was then set up onto the mean streets of Easter Road. And a year later, <laughs> we're in a new gaff, thankfully. I've, I've spoken about this before, but I, I could not have survived in the old flat. You know, we're locked in COVID, couldn't have done it, man. Um, with the other half working from home you know there's no way we could have made that work logistically and even the fact you couldn't get wifi in the kitchen as well because you're you're going through fucking nine feet of concrete wall solid concrete so yes a year later almost a year later in a new gaff still in Edinburgh we have now recorded more episodes of the podcast in lockdown than we did out of lockdown. That is how fucked up things have become. Um, I'm trying to find the pages now because, again, he- here's the thing with COVID, right? And the situation that we now find ourselves in. It is utterly pointless having any hope of what might happen literally a week into the future because we are... Both governments now are so fucked up in their logic and what the response to this is we're literally going day to day as I'm recording this I have been told that the bold Nicola is doing an update this evening God knows what that is going to bring um, it does feel as if we're we're almost in a kind of not a one-upmanship you know not a my dad's bigger than your dad I mean it's it's starting to get there it is starting to feel a little bit like that. By what I mean is, whatever England's response is, we'll stick 10% on top of it. You, you may, I mean, I know we hate football um, chat on this podcast, but I'm sure David Murray, ex-Rangers chairman, had a famous quote at one point saying, for every £5 they spend, meaning Celtic, for every £5 they spend, we'll spend £10. And it is starting to feel a little bit like that when it's now getting down to kind of government briefings, you know? If Boris is going to lock them down for a week, I'll lock you down for a month and keep you safe. Even again today, what is the point in going on about it, Scott? I don't know. Even again today, walking to the shop, uh, 
to get some coffee. You, you don't need to know that, but I was going to get coffee. I'm out of coffee, for God's sake. How can we function with no caffeine in the gaff? And um, the streets are swamped, man. They're mobbed. The streets are mobbed. The shops are packed. It has gone on too long now. We've, we're too far down the road for anybody to really give a fuck anymore. You know, and I know that I know that numbers of positive cases are going up, but then test results are going up. So there's a there's a balance in there, or there's an argument as to as to why test results are increasing. You know, positive test results are increasing. But I really don't. I don't know what's going to happen, man. I just I just can't even believe that we're now pushing towards October, and we're still going to be this. It's going to be interesting to see what happens at the end of October. Eh? If, they, if they keep the goths away for Halloween, there'll be fucking blood that will run in the streets. Christ, you, you think that they've had a hard time waiting until they fucking tell the goths they can't have a Halloween party? <laughs> you mean that we can't dress up as sexy vampires and get in each other's sisters? Nah, locked in. That seems to be the one. Is that a holiday? I don't know. It's an American. I think it's an American thing, anyway. But that seems to be the one kind of time of the year when you know adults, grown men and women, seem to get really hysterical about. I can't wait for Halloween. I'm going to paint my face terrifying. More terrifying than you paint your face every holiday. Yeah, JK bastard. So I. That's going to be the next challenge for, for Nicola if she can keep the goths away from the Halloween parties. <laughs> does, any, does any fucker still bob for apples? Is that a thing? Does anybody really get their head in a bucket of water and go fishing for apples? Halloween's, Halloween's changed, man, you know? It's kind of, it's, it's the one kind of, is it a celebration? I don't even know what you call it. It's no a holiday, right? It's no a holiday. It's no a celebration. What the fuck is it? An excuse for a party. Whatever, Halloween that time of year seems to be the one where everybody's kind of hung on to it, you know? I've been to some good Halloween parties over the years. I've been to some god-awful Halloween parties over the years. I think that either it's good for the Waynes because they get to dress up, or I think if you can get a group of friends and make it kind of, you know, get get back to the, the horror and the kind of darkness and the kind of scare side of Halloween, that's when it gets fun but if it's just a case of everybody's getting, you know stripped out in their underwear and the one guy in the group has got a six pack painting the cell green I'm going as the Hulk <laughs> then it maybe detracts from you know what a Halloween party is how did we get talking to Halloween I don't know because we started thinking about goths and lockdown and then it led us to Halloween, anyway Bojangles, um has come out with an update um, regarding pubs um, in England. I'm seeing here uh, on the BBC News, uh, coronavirus, how are pubs keeping customers safe? They're no, is the answer. Uh, they're no. Um, I mean, you only need to look at the number of cases. Look look at, for example, that pub in Aberdeen that started the, the spread that caused Aberdeen to go back into lockdown. Even even in Edinburgh, there was a pub in Edinburgh, right? What, a couple of hundred yards from where I am that had a, that had a case of COVID that, that forced it to close for a bit. What what can what can pubs really do? What can cafes really do? What can what can anybody really do to truly safeguard against a virus that we probably still don't even fucking understand? But yet you're asking people to stick up a bit of perspex and, you know, wash in a work top every now and again. It seems mad. And this whole curfew thing is if, you know, coronavirus stays in its bed to fucking eight o'clock at night. Again, seems mad. It's just it's just adding to this idea that, one, you can understand those conspiracists that are like, this isn't real, it's all just made up. Because this whole curfew thing, that's got nothing to do with a, a pandemic. Like, a, a disease doesn't Disney have a, a, a start time. You know, the pandemic's no sitting going, I tell you something, see when I get let out, I'm going to infect every cunt. But remember, you can't leave before 10 o'clock. 
Oh, I'm, I'm itching at the bit to go and get them. So, um, the article read here that pubs and restaurants in England, and the only reason I'm reading this is because I imagine that we will have some kind of further extension of what we currently have at the moment, for England anyway. It says here, from Thursday 24th September, which is tomorrow, as you listen, all pubs, bars, restaurants, cafes and other hospitality venues in England must close by 10pm. Because COVID's a fucking nighttime pandemic. <laughs> COVID-19 is a, is, is a night, it's a twilight virus, you know, it loves a lie in. And if you're in the pub at five minutes past ten, you'll fucking catch it. Hospital events in must close by 10pm. They will be restricted by law to table service only, except for takeaways. Table bookings of more than six are not allowed and groups cannot mingle. Businesses are legally required to take customers' contact details. We've been doing that. So they can be traced if there is an outbreak. They can be fined up to £10,000 if they take reservations for more than six. Do not enforce social distancing or do not take customers' contact details. Staff in hospitality venues must now wear masks as must customers when not seated at their table to eat or drink. The penalty for not wearing one or breaking the rule of six has doubled to a £200 for a first offence. Again, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Now listen, I might be completely wrong with all this, and I might be reading that completely wrong and no understanding it, but it just doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever. None of those measures are about safeguarding people. None of them. That is continuing to feed the economy, allowing businesses to have the sense that they're trading, but keeping them on a fine line, that fear where it could be shut down at any moment. This, this microphone's buzzing like fuck today. For example, right, let, let's look at the mask situation. Now, if I'm being honest with you, there has been a couple of times when I've gone into a shop or I've gone into a cafe or whatever and the staff are not wearing masks and that does blow my mind a wee bit. Whether you believe in masks or not, whether you think it does anything, whether you think it protects you or protects someone else, I think if you're in the environment where you are dealing with the public, you know, or even things like dealing with food, you know, just have a fucking mask on, put gloves on. That still blows my mind. When you go into like a bar or a cafe or a restaurant, and the staff only wearing masks. That I think that's mental. But even there, if you're in a cafe, you know, from this Thursday, in England, and we should stress this is England, so we don't really know what it's going to be like in Scotland, but I imagine it will be an extension of what's been said here. If you're standing in a restaurant, if you're standing in a cafe, mask on, because COVID can get you. But as soon as you're seated at a table... Yeah, you can take the mask off, you can eat, you can drink, you can spit, you can spray. It just, it just, I don't know, I'm, fi I'm finding it really hard, again, because it feels as if we're, we're always getting a little bit that we, we're almost given the feeling that we may be getting back to, you know, to the way that life used to be. And I, I suppose I'm taking it harder than most because... I cannot get back to gigs. I cannot get back to work. That's the frustrating thing for me. That's what it's all doing to you. you know, and I get incredibly frustrated when I'm seeing people in England doing gigs. I'm seeing people sitting in a cafe, you know, packed to the gunners. I'm even seeing fucking these hipster food markets that I'm in where the social distance complying and that is a bit of fucking plywood separating you from somebody at the other end of the table. Nobody is social distance. Nobody is social distance. There's a bit of plywood there. And that's classed as you being distanced. When you're sitting shoulder to shoulder with someone else, separated by about a four mil ply. As if coronavirus will kind of go, oh, if only there was a way to get through a bit of plywood. I don't know, the next bit here is giving you a breakdown in Scotland and Wales. It says, in Scotland, up to six people from two households can meet either indoors or outdoors. 
If children under 12 are part of the two households, they will not count towards the limit of six people. Face coverings must be worn if you are not seated at a table. In Wales, up to six people aged 12 or over from an extended household can meet inside. What does extended household mean? In Northern Ireland, gatherings indoors or outdoors not in a private dwelling of up to 15 people are permitted. In Northern Ireland, gatherings indoors or outdoors of up to 15 people are permitted. Well, that's bullshit because there's gigs in Northern Ireland. But only if the venue has carried out a COVID risk assessment. I mean, it just, every, everything's different. Everything's different for everywhere. And it's frustrating, man. But hey, we wait, we baited breath to see what tonight's update will be with regards to COVID. It's just, it's just that, that constant feeling that something else is going on. Now, I know I've watched every episode of The X-Files. I've watched some documentaries and I'm like, the fucking bastards are lying to us about everything. But you can't help but feel as if you are putting yourself in a position where you're going, something else is happening here. I don't know what it is, man, but something's going on and they're not fucking telling us. Will the truth come out? Probably not in our lifetime. Or it'll be buried in a fucking Hollywood film that'll come out in ten years' time. And we'll all go, that's a lot of shite, and then that will actually be the truth as to what's happened. No hearing a lot about China as well. Do you know what I mean? What the fuck's happening out there? They're all back having beach parties and gone mental. How's that? Eh? God knows, man. It's hard. It's hard. I want to just try and stay away from COVID. I've, I've stopped watching the news at all about anything because I just I can't keep every fucking day being told the same shit. And I suppose you've got to take your hat off to the news outlets, you know? Being able to spin stories every single day without any factual information or without telling you a single thing about what's going on but every day they fucking churn that shit out you've, to be fair to them you've got to take your hands after these guys man they're doing a fucking they're doing a good job they're doing a good job so a little news story that I saw I actually saw this a couple of weeks ago maybe two weeks ago but I just never got a chance to talk about it and then I actually happened to notice the uh, picture that I had uh, got off the internet and downloaded and uh, but when I saw it I thought it actually made me think a little bit about travel, um, but let's just jump straight in. You you may or may not have seen this, but the uh, Thai Airways, um, which is a, an airline company, it's not a, you know, a candle shop or your local Thai restaurant, although it could be Thai Airways, would you call a restaurant Thai? Thai Airways. Apologies for the accent. But the, um, the airline company Thai Airways has launched a, a restaurant um, where it's given diners the opportunity, <laughs> the opportunity to experience uh, airline food, um, you know, in a in a restaurant. In a restaurant. <laughs> you, do you know when you when you when you see something, and and you and you read about it, and you and you look at the pictures, and then you just are constantly thinking to yourself, why? This is this is one of them. This is one of them. I mean, they, they look happy enough, those people. You know, they look very happy. Uh, they're sitting in a wee conversation. She's like, ah, listen, he'll have uh, egg fried rice and uh, two, have you got singtao? Uh, two pints uh, two pints of lager. And uh, that's what that's, that's i But then these people are probably all staged for media. Now, to go into the article itself, it says that it has given them the opportunity. Now, I think that this has obviously been set up. It's been set up because of COVID, right? I don't think anybody has been bombarding Thai Airways going, listen, see that chicken dish that you give out on your flights? I have been craving that since lockdown. Nobody craves airline food. Nobody, right? There, there isn't a person on the planet who's had a meal in an airplane and went, that's one of the greatest things I've ever had. Maybe if you've flown... First class with one of the fancy UEE, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, slave trading airlines. Maybe you've had a cracking dinner, right? Nothing compared. Because your your taste buds are different. Everything works differently at that point. There was a Heston Blumenthal, who's also a fucking headbanger. He had, a, I'm sure, a, a series on, I want to say BBC, maybe Channel 4. And he was looking at airline food. 
and how airline food is very heavily salted and they'll, they'll add an awful lot of salt into it because at that altitude, your, your taste buds work differently, so you kind of taste things the same. And they have to, you know, make up the meals and, and season them in a different way so that you actually get some fucking flavour at the damn thing, right? How they, again, how they test that, I've no idea. It could just be somebody who's got a real tolerance for salt. I like salty food. Hello. They send me up with a fucking fish tea. I'm like, this needs more salt. There's so much of salt in it. It's because of the height. It's the altitude, mate. Can't taste the salt. Know what I mean? So the article says, uh, and this is from the Business Traveller, by the way. This is none of your metro and shite here. This is businesstraveller.com. I'll have you know. Thai Airways has opened a restaurant that mimics the design of its plane cabin at its headquarters in Bangkok for flying enthusiasts missing the travel experience. What? Flying enthusiasts <laughs> who are missing the travel experience. Now, I mean, look at that picture. That, first of all, that is not a plane, right? Nobody's facing each other. That's probably a first class seat as well. So if, if they were actually setting this up to give you the flying experience, then you should probably have the seat in front of you jammed right up against you. Like, I can't, there's very few flights I've ever taken where I can get a tray table down. One, because the fucking gut that's on me. And two, you are jammed in like battery hens. And you're telling me that there's people out there who are actually sitting going, do you know what I miss? I miss eating my dinner off some cunt's head in front of me. That's what I miss. I wish there was some way we could get into the headquarters of the tire with and eat our fucking dinner. Basically what they've done is they've, they've got hundreds of seats off a plane, right? These poor bastards, man. To be fair, I'm wearing masks, but wearing masks, to be fair to them. They've got these fuckers. They've got a couple of chairs, seats, out of an old fucking Boeing 747 or whatever. Set it up in one of the conference rooms in the headquarters. And went, do you know what we can do? Get a load of people in here. Give them the fucking dinner. I mean, I, I suppose it's, it's a good idea, isn't it? It's something that's novelty. I imagine there's hipsters out in Thailand as well. Listen, if, if somebody done that here in Edinburgh, for God's sake, got a whole load of airplane seats and put it in a restaurant, they'd be fucking queued around the block, man. They'd be booked to it for months. The restaurant doesn't say a name. It's not got a name. just says the restaurant, which is open to the public, seeks to recreate the in-flight experience by offering plain food and decor that features the airline's iconic purple, orange and pink plane seats and pillows. There's also a beanbag seating area. Oh, a beanbag... <laughs> a beanbag seating area, which is obviously common in most Thai Airways flights. I would imagine. Trying to recreate that in-flight experience by having children scream and a drunken couple... You know, they're drafting in the tie Franco and Sandra to have a Barney in the other end of the plane. Are you are you gonna are you gonna have to pay pay more money to have a good seat? Have they brought in uh, two portaloos to put at either end of the restaurant? So everybody's got to queue down the middle aisle to go for a shite, and then you're getting your dinner last because you're at the other end for the kitchen. So you're sitting tucking into your fucking Thai green curry. As the toilet door keeps wafting and a big fucking blow of shite comes in the restaurant. Is that, is that recreating the experience? <laughs> You're going to be sitting sweating. 30 degree heat. Jamming fucking crap free earbuds into your ears because you put your fucking good earbuds in your case and it's going into the hole and you can't get them. So you've got shite rock music for the 90s blasting into your sweaty eardrums because it's those earbuds that have still got the bit of cloth over it because you've no idea how the fuck they're still in circulation but their own tie airways recreate the in-flight experience shut up do you think you get the wee dinners? I wonder if they I wonder see I would hope that they would give you your meal inside that wee plastic tray with the silver you know, lid on it like a fucking giant pot noodle. I hope that's what you get. I imagine it's going to be on a plate and it's all fancy and there's a wine menu and a cocktail menu. 
The national carrier has grounded most of its planes due to the coronavirus uh, crisis and filed for bankruptcy protection in May. The government of Thailand said it would allow the airline to restructure under the supervision of the local bankruptcy court. Diners at Thai Airways restaurant will be greeted by crew members dressed in full uniform. They will also receive a boarding pass as a souvenir. The restaurant is open from Wednesday to Friday from 7am. 7am? Who's going to fucking Thai restaurant at 7 in the morning? The airline says it will begin serving international cuisine between 9am and 2pm. Partner is also a bakery. I mean, you've got, I suppose at the same time, you've got to think, right? You've, you've got to do something to try and get yourself through COVID. And a lot of people have done some some crazy things, but whoever's been sitting, that, that's been a last ditch desperate attempt at like a young new member of staff to come up with an idea. That's some guy or girl, they've come through university, they've got a, you know, a high falling job at Thai Airways, you've came in two weeks later, lockdowns happened, they've grounded all the flights, and now they're looking to you to come up with some great idea, you know, that's going to generate money so the business doesn't go bust. And you're like, uh, we could put a load of seats in the foyer and turn it into a restaurant, and they're like, I love it. You're going, oh, the name of fuck, what have I done? I'm now trying to think of flights that I've had because I have so I've had some god awful food on flights. The the worst one is if you're ever on a flight and you forget that it's morning, so you're getting a you're getting a breakfast and you peel that wee thing back to have I mean I hate beans anyway, right? This could be controversial, but beans are the work of the devil. But you've got that wee puddle of beans and then like I kind of a, an egg that I don't know how you would describe it, man. It looks like a like a sock that's been through the wash one too many times. It's just a it's an odd colour. It's an odd shape. You don't know if it's scrambled. You don't know if it's an omelette. It's just horrendous looking. And as soon as you, you peel that bit, the smell... There's nothing worse than breakfast on a fucking... Breakfast on a plane! Once I went to America, I mean, I've been a couple of times, but one time we went, mega cheap flights, couldn't believe it, right? And then when we actually looked at it, we realised we were flying to uh, Toronto first, and then we were flying down. So we're going Glasgow to Toronto, Toronto to Atlanta, where my dad was in America. And that last flight from Toronto to Atlanta was like a fucking single engine, you know, two rows of single seats. Mm, one of the most terrifying Terraflying, terraflying, Thai Airlines, don't be terraflying, fly with Thai Airlines, that was one of the most terrifying flights of my life ever, like you walked in the, the, the gangway, the gantry, and uh, we got on the plane and I remember coming in and just seeing like single seats, I'm thinking, can he be, there must be, there must be another plane behind this plane, and then that was us for like five hours all the way to Atlanta in this fucking tiny wee plane terrifying but Air Canada I remember that when we when we flew there I don't think there was a lot of people on the on the flight I think we'd lucked out because we had like a whole row to ourselves so me and my two mates we had like three seats each you know when we took off you're looking about the plane going there's fucking nobody here so we just moved and spaced ourselves out it had amazing space and it was just constant I'll never forget it was just constant food and drink they kept coming down with the trolley, and I remember the first time, I never said, my friend said, how much is a, a, a beer, and she went, it's free, and then we all picked up going, what? She went, yeah, it's, it, food and drink is, is free for your duration of the flight, and I thought, this airline will never fucking last. <laughs> that, that, this airline will not be flying out of Glasgow for very long. And we didn't take the piss, you know, but. Just every time they would come round, you would get like a couple of cans of beer or whatever, and just keeping you topped up. And I remember later on, it was getting a, so we had our dinner on it, and we're having more drinks. And then you get a snack, and at one point she came round again with the trolley, and I thought, fuck it, we have only got an hour or two left. We'll get another couple of cans, man. It's free. You might as well make the most of it. And I says, can we get a drink? And they're like, oh, the drinks trolley will be doing a minute. This is actually pizza. We're like, what the fuck? Just dishing out slices of pizza. I was like, I never want to get off this flight. That's one of the best flights I've been on. Worst flights coming back for Turkey, one of the worst turbulence I have ever experienced. It's the only time when I'm flying, 
I don't really get scared. I do feel as if as soon as the wheels leave the runway, so as soon as you feel that kind of, you know, you feel your body sink into the floor and then lift up, right? And that's when it comes off the runway and you're now, you're now flying. As soon as I feel that, I think no matter what happens now, we're dead. We've passed the point of no return. There's no point in worrying. There's no point in being scared because as soon as you're off the ground, you're dead. You've, you've, you've officially died until you land again. That's the way I think it, right? Now, that could be wrong. That could be a stupid way to think about it. But that's the way that I think about it. What is this notification? So, um, turbulence a couple of times in a plane. You, If you've flown enough, you, you, you're used to it or you understand what it is. You know, you're going through a cloud or changing pressure, whatever. But this time in Turkey, this was the first time where the planes dropped I don't know if you ever had that, but that's terrifying. When you're just, be, and all of a sudden you just drop out of the air. And it kept doing it about three or four times to the point where you're going, is this this guy's first flight? What the fuck is he doing? Now, it'd been on and off for about an hour. And people were screaming. <laughs> people were screaming in the flight. People were getting really worked up. And I think you could tell that it was bad because even the, the crew, see when the cabin crew start to kind of grab onto stuff, that's when you know, right, that it's bad, man. it's bad if they're reacting to it, and there was one point where they would just drop and drop and drop, and I did that about three times, then drop and drop, and you could see, like, who was the heat, air hostess, air crew, whatever, you could just see the look in her face as if, what the fuck is that arsehole there, <laughs> like, am I going to have to get in there and fly this fucking plane for them? So we'd had bad turbulence and I couldn't hold this shite any longer. Like, I could not hold. I was either getting to that toilet or I was going to shit myself on this fucking plane. So I remember getting to the toilet, going to the toilet and then fucking turbulence as I was on the shit <laughs> man. And I was coming up and half the toilet and I was banging about. And then the air hostess came to the door and told me that I couldn't I couldn't leave, I had to sit in there and there was a seatbelt, I never knew that either. There was a seatbelt on the toilet. I had to strap myself to the fucking shit. I had to strap myself at the toilet. Thankfully I'd finished I'd finished the job by this point, you know, but I remember they're sitting strapped into a toilet, thinking I would probably quite happily finish the flight out in here. There's more space, I can stretch my legs out. <laughs> if I could have got my dinner served in there you know I could have rested on the wee sink that's when you know that flying economy that most of us will fly is pretty shit you know when you've got more space in the toilet than what you have in your own seat it's, it's a pretty shit experience man excuse the pun I've never flown first class never and I'd love to do it, man. But it's expensive, you know. It's crazy, man. I remember once looking at a ticket to go to New York, I think it was, and going, am I buying this plane? Like, fucking insane money. Who knows what's in the corner? You know, 2021, let's hope. Fresh start, new beginnings. Uh, let's hope there's some good times ahead. Maybe there'll be a wee first-class business flight in there as well at some point. Who knows? But, uh, aye. Maybe this will catch on. Maybe this will be the new thing. Maybe British Airways, EasyJet. I wonder what an EasyJet. I mean, it would just be a burger van. <laughs> an EasyJet restaurant would just be literally EasyJet giving you their dinner. There would be there wouldn't be a chef. They'd just bring the boxes in. They'd steam them. They'd fire them out. There'd be a wet t-shirt competition. We'd smash some plates, and then you got the road. Again, probably a great night out. As always, got some questions uh, from the rascals on Patreon. Thank you to those of you who got in touch. Um, let's look at some of them. Just let's, hey, let's look at some questions, shall we? Um, again, if you like to ask a question on the show, please do get in touch. Um, and if you want to get access to all the extra episodes, Patreons get a f- episode every single Friday, as well as access to a whole lot of different goodies and whatnot. And hopefully, twenty twenty one when we get back to some kind of normality. Um, we'll get regular gigs back up and running again, man. It would be nice. It would be really nice to have some kind of new material night again. Um, just to kind of run out of some stuff, 
every month. That that's something that I really want to try and you know get together again for next year. But you know we'll wait and see again. Let's wait and see what Nicholas got to say the night eh, before we start thinking about next year. For the love of God. Right, here we go. Andrew Ward. Um, as always, big man, thank you for your support and your questions. We've got a question for Bobby Curry and another Andrew as well. Um, Andrew Ward started watching The Boys uh, on you and Chicky Mouse recommendations. Blitz through season one. The question is your superhero name and special powers. Uh, first of all, The Boys. If you've not watched that, get it watched, man. Absolutely bright. It's on Amazon. Um, one of the best things I've watched in years. Genuinely one of the best things I've watched in years. And I, I, I was talking about this, oddly enough, to, to Mal Malokali, who I do the hashtag show with another podcast. Um, I don't know if I'm loving it because it's, it is that good or because a lot of stuff is just really, really shit. So when something comes along that isn't shit, am I thinking that it's amazing and giving it more praise than it deserves? With this, I don't think so. I think it's just a fucking brilliant show. Amazing actors, wonderfully cast. Everybody is fantastic in it. There's not one weak character in it. Oddly, in saying that, right, I watched The Shining last night. Now, I've not watched it in years. And I remember, like, before bigging it up, going, one of the greatest films you'll ever see. Such iconic scenes in it. You know, some of the most noticeable images or parts of 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 cinema have came from The Shining. Wonderful film. And see when I watched it last night, man, two things. One, is it Shelley Duval? Is that her name? Who plays the, the wife in it? J- Jesus Christ, no. I know that she got slated for it and I know, I, I don't think she ever worked again. I think she maybe did one other thing in it and then kind of drifted away, but she's awful man like she's 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 really really bad it almost adds a kind of comical element to it when you watch it again there was a couple of times in it where i was generally laughing at some of the acting i'm thinking it's 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 incredible to think that what was a hollywood blockbuster i mean it was a, a massive film when it first came out that she's been able to go through the casting process and then has been casted for that role. And I was reading a thing after it where I know that Stanley Kubrick had been given her, I think had been pretty awful to her on set and been pretty horrible, but... You know, at the same time, man, I mean, if you are if you, if you you are making a film and you're responsible for it, you're the director, and and the the actors that you have, have cast, whether you've been responsible for that or not, are just fucking dog shit, man. It must be brutal. It must be brutal. Oddly enough as well, a couple of scenes in The Shining as well where I'm going, there's no way that would get made today. And probably, I mean, I never knew they said the N-word as many times as they did in The Shining. I was like, jeez, even that shot, we went, bloody hell, man. When was this made? 1880. But I mean, you just have to watch it. It's one of those films that you have to see. So, going back to the boys, amazing, very rough breakdown of it, if you've not seen it, it is about a group of superheroes, um, and they're basically, they're, they're bastards, they're horrendous, they murder people, they kill people, they are horrible at each other, they've got, you know, they're, they're caught up in celebrity lifestyle, it's just wonderful, right, it's wonderful, it takes the idea, I suppose, of if you had superheroes, if superheroes were real, how would they actually fit into the real world? So it's not like a Batman or a Superman where obviously it is fictional and the show is fictional, but the setting isn't fictional. But that, I mean, is aliens only coming from outer space to kill us and, you know, you've no got um, exaggerated bad guys like the Joker or Two-Face or whatever, the Penguin who's still my favourite bad guy in the Batman uh, series. But these superheroes fit into day-to-day lives, how they're marketed, how they're put across, how the business sells merchandise and blah, 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 right? And it's brilliant, man. It's absolutely brilliant. 
lot of blood, a lot of gore, but it's kind of Tarantino blood, if that makes sense, in that it's it looks fake. Um, so it's, you know, there's some graphic scenes in it, but nothing to, nothing detracts from it. It's just brilliant. And when I had been recommended it, recommended it to me by a couple of people, um, and I wasn't too sure because the person who said it to me, I thought, you've never recommended anything decent in your life. And then I watched it and I was blown away and blasted the first season. And then the second season's come out and Amazon's doing that thing where they're dripping out episodes a little bit. So I don't think full series two is out yet. But if you've not watched it, man, you need to check out the boys. It's absolutely fucking brilliant. What would my superhero name be and superpowers? Name, I've no idea. I think it all depends on what your power is. Because that seems to be where the names come from. Although you've got like a Captain America kind of guy, right? And uh, his name's Homelander. <laughs> Fucking Homelander. Superpowers. I would probably want... I'd definitely want flight. I'd want to be able to fly. And I think I'd want some kind of like... Laser or some kind of... Something that I can shoot. Whether it be eyes... Or palm of the hand. I think, see ones like control the weather. That's shite. Right, see Storm and the X-Men. Shite. People that control like the seas and the bollocks. There's a guy in, uh, in uh, the boys who just runs fast. But that's pish as well. Although there is quite a good scene when he runs through somebody uh, at top speed and they just explode. That's quite interesting. But to have a superhero power is speed. That's shit. It's like Stretch Armstrong. Shit. What's your superpowers? Uh, I can fly. I have incredible strength and I can shoot lasers from my eyeballs. Amazing. What about yourself? I can run very fast. Right? And uh, yes, super fast. But your superhero, your, your powers, yes, lightning speed. Okay, I mean, that's fucking DHL. What are you going to do with that? Challenge Usain Bolt, next. Got to take that later, take a coddy. Anything else? Jesus Christ, that was fast. I'm fucking lightning, son. Absolute lightning. Smash my power. So I'd want flight. Flight and lasers. That's what I'd want. Fucking flying. Strong as fuck. And lasers for the eyeballs. What I would use that for, I don't know. Heating up soup. You know, um, I could I could fly lifts broke. Uh, I could fly soup up to somebody, hand it through the window. Woman's thank you, son. We've not been able to get it because it has arthritis and the lifts broke. Not a problem, doll. You know, just two tin two tins of uh, cockalicky. Do you hear that, Franco cockalicky? And then she'd put it on the counter and I'd be like, "Stand back, madam!" And then fucking and. Warm the suit up for pet, you know, so you'd have, you'd have that. Um, Hunters of stuff. Cut up a tree, fucking, there's the game, you know. <laughs> Flight, lasers, and strength. Superhero name, you're all da. <laughs> <laughs> you're all da would be the, <laughs> the greatest Scottish superhero ever. <laughs> is it a bird is it a plane no it's your old da <laughs> swoop in what's the problem hen I've got to get these two tins of cockalicky up to my mother she's on the 19th floor you're out to me darling your old da to the rescue <laughs> I love you your old da your old da there you go that's a, that's a superhero name the name is you're all da. And what's your superpowers? I can fly, I can fight, and I've got lasers in my eyes. Join the Patreon. <laughs> there you go, Andy boy. What would your what would your superheroes? What would your powers be? What would your name be? See, your old da needs needs like a gang. You know, your old da, your mad uncle, your crazy auntie. Together we are fucking the young team. Your old da. Oh, good stuff. Um, right, question from Andrew. Um, 
Question. You like food, as you say, and also a good movie, but what's your favourite food you have seen in a movie? Is it the raw eggs in Rocky or the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man in Ghostbusters? Good question, mate. Very good question. Food in movies. Now, I, I have not watched it myself, but I have seen it in a documentary. And I think it's a French film. And again, I don't know the name of it. I don't know the name. Let's Google it. We're sitting at the computer, man. Let's Google it. Now, the movie itself, right? Is a, I think it's a young a young woman. And she... I think she's trying to impress... She's trying to impress somebody with her, with her food. Um... I don't know if it's an employer or I think she's trying to impress like somebody to invest in a business. I think the story is that they're maybe, you know, they're maybe poor or they're, they're, they're not well known, but she's trying to make it in the culinary world. Anyway, the, the film itself, and I remember watching this documentary about food was talking about how that has got some of the most realistic and iconic um, food scenes in it because the food that she makes, very historical French cooking, you know, big sauces and beef bargain and all, and all this kind of mad shit. Um, the film itself might be bollocks, but I suppose it would be a good one to watch. Again, don't know what it's called, man. I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at this here in the hope that something may have come up, but, you know, it could be anything and I can't fucking, I can't fucking see it. Food-wise in the movie, I mean, you can't really go past Ratatouille, can you? <laughs> Ratatouille is uh, probably most of our introduction to cooking on the big screen. Food on the telly, I don't know. An interesting thing I always remember that stuck with me is David Jason, right? Uh, obviously, Del Boy. He there was a there was a thing where it was one of these you know talking head movie things, and it's talking about British television and whatnot. And the thing was, what does David Jason and, and Brad Pitt have in common, right? And again, it's one of these things like clickbait, where it's just it's just designed to keep you watching. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't know what what does, what does Brad Pitt and David Jason have in common? And one of the other things is that they're always eating on screen. They'll always eat in a movie. A lot of actors, well, they had a, they had a guy on who's like a, I think he sets scenes or builds sets for Hollywood, and he was talking about that a lot of actors will just play with the food on a plate, like cut it up, and he talked you through the process of. And showed you a couple of scenes of people who will cut up food and go to put something in the mouth and then put it away and talk. And how, as you watch that, as, as a viewer, as an audience member, your brain thinks that they are eating, but they've not actually taken a single bite. And even when you see the plate of food on screen, it looks as if it's being consumed because it's being cut up and moved and stuff's going up. And, but nothing's actually been done. And then it showed you scenes with David Jason and... Brad Pitt and they are, I mean, tucking into food and shoving their face and, and consuming it. And the interview was with David Jason because it's a British thing because I don't imagine they're going to go, listen, Brad, any chance you can go on to this talking head for Channel 5? <laughs> going to talk about that time you ate a fucking full paella on the telly? But David Jason's thing was that it gives, he feels that it gives characters that last bit of human touch, that roundness, because people... We talk while we eat in real life, you know, and, and to see someone actually physically eating something on the television, like, in, as if they're enjoying it, like eating a meal and talking and conversing, it just adds an extra layer to that realness of a character. And again, it's very subtle and something you don't, you probably wouldn't even pick up until it's explained to you and then you watch the clips and you go, he's actually eating that dinner, that's very, he's actually eating that fucking dinner, it must be freezing. Food in a movie. I'm trying to think of movies that I've seen. Um, Burnt was a good film. Um, Bradley Cooper plays a chef, kind of rock and roll chef. There's some good cooking in that. I mean, the main one is the film Chef, um, which is which is an absolutely. Do you know what? It's just not only is it a great film about food. It's just a it's just a great film altogether. John Favreau, um, who else is in it? John Favreau, uh, Sofia Vergara, Scarlett Johansson, uh, John Logazamo, 
Robert Downey Jr. apparently in it as well. Did not know that. But the film Chef, 2014 that came out. Um, John Favreau's character, a chef, uh, trying to, I suppose, advance his cooking career, maybe stuck in a rut. Um, something that I imagine a lot of chefs will go through over their careers where they become quite well known and the restaurant's quite famous um, and they're, they're booked out night after night. And um, the, the person who owns the restaurant doesn't want anything to change because what they've got is, you know, it's it's working. Why why fix something that's no broke? And um, John Favreau's character as the chef wants to start making new dishes and a new menu because he is slated by a food critic um, for, you know, being stuck in the olden days and churning out the same stuff over and over again. Even though the food is of a very high standard and a very good quality, that creative side of a chef wants to push forward. And, and I suppose that, you know, that obviously translates into real life. I mean, without a doubt, there, there must be... There must be a lot of restaurants out there who will be known for a certain dish or known for a menu. You may have had it in the past where you have a restaurant that you you regard as your favourite restaurant and it's the one place you always go for any celebration, right? And this is our place. And then you go back one day and the decor's changed or the menu's changed and you're in an uproar. You're like, I can't believe they took the fucking fish finger sandwich off the menu for the love of God, we'll never be back. And it could be a real hard thing for you because you feel as if the thing you love has been taken away, but you're maybe in that restaurant three times a year, four times a year, if that. You know, these guys are cooking the same stuff over and over and over again. So if they are, I suppose, a, a real chef over a cook, they're going to have that desire to continue to turn their menu over or move with the seasons or look at new techniques or new things. And if they don't have the opportunity to do that, I imagine it becomes quite stagnant. So in the film, John Favreau's character uh, quits or is fired and uh, is lost and has to refine himself and connect with his son, which is the B story to the movie. Buys a food truck, uh, kits it out. One of his pals for the, the kitchen comes and helps him. And then they drive the food truck home through parts of America, doing different events in a way, tasting different food, seeing different food, experiencing different food. And um, it's a brilliant film. It's probably one of the... It's probably one of the only films I have seen that, that kind of mixes that, you know, food culture perfectly in the story. Because it never feels at any point as, a, as, as it as it forced. You know, it just feels natural with the, with the film and the kind of journey they're on. It would be an amazing thing to do, an incredible thing to do, even an amazing thing to do in Scotland. To be in that position where you could take a month, two months, and just travel all over Scotland. You know, trying different foods and learning about different techniques and things like that. It would be an incredible experience. I, I was in Anstruther at the weekend, right? And I just out for a drive, man, take a dog to the beach and just go out for a wee bit and... As I was going up the East Coast, now I, I go to Arbroath every single year with a tour show because I love it there. I love the theatre, Webster's Theatre, the the team behind it, they're amazing people. I, I just love, I love that space and I love the gig. I've never had an Arbroath Smokey, never. 36 years of age, never had it. Never even been up to see it. You know, an, an iconic food product from Scotland and I've never had it how many of us have how many of us have been to our broth you wouldn't you think twice about going to Blackpool for the weekend going to Manchester going to London Liverpool you know how many of us would think let's go and I know this will sound stupid let's go to, let's go up to our broth get an Airbnb or a wee cheap hotel for the weekend and try the Arbroath Smokies <laughs> none of us would do that None of us would. But maybe we should be doing it. Life's a journey, man. We've got to experience stuff. I want to try a real smoky. Fuck me, man. It's actually smoky. <laughs> Chef is a great film, man. You should watch it if you've not seen it. It's making me think... No, it's making me think the Cubanos. Hey, the Cubanos. The, the sandwiches. The Latina Mac. The sandwiches. The Cubanos. 
It's making me think of it. It's basically a ham and cheese fucking piece. Squash dune, right? That's what it is. It's making me hungry now, man. Think about it. Great film. Good food in that. Food in other in other films. I'm trying to think now. I'm, I'm stumped a wee bit. Something might come up to me later on, mate, and I'll I'll maybe remember it, but I'm trying to think if there's any like iconic scenes in movies that's involved food or like a feast. But even then, you know, there's 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 endless stuff like medieval films and whatnot, and they've got banquets and things, and that doesn't interest me, but like stuff like the film Burnt, which is you know, in a in a restaurant and kind of high end cooking and going for the Michelin star, that's interesting and and Chef is interesting, man. That's a good film. That's a good question, mate. That's a that's a fucking great question. Andy boy. Get in touch, man. Let us know though. If, if there's any films that you've watched, television shows, um you obviously know by now if you're listening to this, I absolutely love my food. Um maybe next year, maybe twenty twenty one. The start of new beginnings for a lot of us. Exciting times ahead. You know, we, we can't dwell too much upon negatives and what might have been or what we've lost or what's, you know, what has left us. We maybe need to start kind of repositioning the old the old brain, the old grey matter into thinking, right, think of, you know, a loss not as that, but as, as an opportunity to, to move on and do something else. And maybe next year will be the year I, you know, I finally start to do something in, in food as well. Obviously, the comedy will never end. We'll always be touring. But I maybe I'm, I'm starting. To, I'm starting to get that feeling, man. That I would. I would love to go into that. So maybe. But listen, if you've watched anything, if you know any documentaries, any films, uh, that, I would, that I should be watching, then hey, get in touch, man. Get in touch. Right, Bobby Curry. Let's do your question, big man. Um, not so much a question as a hypothetical. Already, I love it. Phone rings. Your agent says you have been drafted to fill in on QI. And you can choose one other comedian to appear alongside you. Then the message runs in and says you've got an email from Mock the Week offering you the same deal. Twist is, filming at the same time. Which show do you choose and which comedian do you choose to join you? Do you take the opportunity to appear alongside... Do you take the opportunity to appear alongside a heat or... Right, there's always a spell here. Hang on. Do you take the opportunity to appear alongside someone you may never have the chance to work with, or do you bring along a friend whose career could take off with the opportunity? Okay, I get you. So let's go to the first one. If the choice is QI or Mock the Week, I'm doing QI. Every day of the week, I'm doing QI. Um, I'd love to do panel shows, I'd love to do television. It's never going to happen. I accept that. That's why I don't dwell on it or think about it too much and I just move on. I, I'm i sure I've said this before, but I my strength is live. There are a lot of comedians out there who are not great live comedians. They're either structured, they're very script heavy, they lend themselves well to a nice wee 20 minute set. I am the opposite of that. I've always been great live. Live performing will always be the thing that I do very well and better than most. So when there's some shows that are out there, I, I never really get kind of I've never thought as if that side of the business or that that world is is available to me, oddly. So I've never really you know, I, I don't find my I never get jealous or I don't get worked up about it because I, I generally don't think that that is for me. But there is a couple of shows that I would love to do. I'd love to do QI. I'd love to have done Buzzcocks. And I'd love to do Have I Got News For You. I'd love to do them. But again, it's not going to happen, you know. But out of those two, QI Mock the Week. QI would be the one to do. If I had the opportunity to bring, you know, someone along with me, obviously that's the right thing to do. And that's exactly what I would be doing. Again, there's... There's not enough done, really, I think, in in comedy. I don't believe for people bringing, you know, groups through and friends through. I really don't. I think when push comes to shove, a lot of people are narrow-minded and kind of look after themselves. And that's maybe why there's a lot of bitter, jealous people out there, you know, and there's a lot of people who are out to, to kind of push others down so hopefully they can progress. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not a healthy environment to, to begin with. 
definitely would bring a friend on. Um, I think QI would be a great one for it because it's, you know, it's a it's a, a kind of co-host if you like. So if you two regulars, and then two guests, so it would be good to be on with one of the co-hosts and then have your mate sit across for you. Even that would be fun. Even that would be an amazing experience to do that with your pal and have that experience together and then have a good bit of banter as well. It would be great. Um, Alan Davis would be a good one to be on with. Maybe on his team or Bill Bailey if that was the option. Um, I, I, I gigged once for Alan Davis years ago. He was in Dunf- uh, Dunfermline, Dunfermline at Carnegie Hall. And I got the opportunity to open for him. And uh, I went in before it and met him. And he, here's the thing as well, which I learned. And, I mean, I knew I knew it anyway. But I think this was the one time where it was cemented. You know, sometimes in life you'll hear rumours, you know, and you'll hear things about people. And you're always told, like, you know, don't judge them until you've... Well, I'm always taught anyway don't judge someone until either they've wronged you or you you know confirm it yourself that's what I've always been told anyway and kind of grew up with and I'd heard a load of stuff from other people about Alan Davies right that he was a, you know a pain in the arse or he was a dick or would he do this would he do that one of the generally one of the nicest men I've ever met truly one of the nicest men I've ever had the pleasure to be in his company. A, a true gent, a, a lovely, lovely man. Um, I remember coming in, introduced myself, sat down, he, he was on the phone to his wife, he was in a, a video call with his wife, and, uh, you know, then he went, oh, this is kind of awkward, turned the phone on, and the three of us were having a conversation, and it was very, very nice, very, uh, she's a lovely woman, and we were just chatting away, and then come off, and then we talked a bit about comedy, and, and then the night took a real weird twist because Gordon Brown, ex-Prime Minister Gordon Brown, his wife and his son were in the audience to see the gig. And his wife came backstage and was sitting in the green room. And I remember I'm just sitting there going, I've got fucking Jonathan Creek here and Gordon Brown's wife standing at the end of the table and they're having a chat about the Labour Party. And I'm going, what the fuck is going on, man? Mental. Mental. And one thing that I found really strange about that whole night was after the after the after I did my opening bit, right? I came obviously off stage and back downstairs out of the green room, and uh, it felt it felt kind of awkward when I was saying because I said like I'll give him some space because I know like I wouldn't want somebody in my ear, literally up to the point I was about to go. So he got a call. Uh, three minutes to come to the side of the stage and I said uh, you know I, I don't know what I said to him but it obviously made him think something else and uh, you know I said oh, have a good one and whatnot. and then I, I went out and I, I had a seat at the back with the promoter that I could watch it and I think the thing was he later on when I was speaking to the promoter after the gig he thought I was I was going to leave he thought I was away he didn't think I was going to stay and watch the gig and again, that just came up because when he'd been doing stuff down south or he'd been doing stuff in London um, with some of these younger comics who'd been opening for him, their mentality was, I'm on the up and he's on the down. That was his words, that's the way he put it, right? I don't think he's on the down at all. But their attitude was, I'm the, you know, I'm the new guy and I'm, I'm the cool kid and I'm, I'm too cool to be hanging about with these old comics. And I've said it before, man, these... These acts will have more stories to tell than we'll ever have. And it's just interesting being in a company. Like, how many of us would ever really get the opportunity to just have a conversation with fucking Jonathan Creek? Do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, so met up again after it once he'd finished. And it was, a, it was a brilliant gig. It was a pleasure to see it because I probably wouldn't have gone to see him myself. There's only really a few comedians that I will go out my way to actually physically go and watch. And I would say, you know, Alan Davies wouldn't be one of them. But watching that set, man, was fucking brilliant. Genuinely brilliant. And just shows again, if you get to that level, maybe in the old days when you got to that level of being a stand-up, it never leaves you. You know, that that ability to tell a story, know when to do a punchline, know when to hold a bit, stretch a bit, it never leaves you. And it was brilliant. 
And it was a great show, a great set of an older guy who's got a bit of money and is famous dealing with having young kids. And it was a fucking great show, man. And it was a, a pleasure to watch. Uh, and that's always stuck with me, him that saying like he was shocked that I kind of hung about to watch. And I'm going like, what, what did you think I was going to do? You think I was going to leave? And then you're going, well, that's what other people have done. I'm going, you've, you've always got to remember that you're in a unique position that you're getting to see something that, that everyone else in that auditorium isn't getting to see because you're getting to see the before and after. You know, you're getting to see the, the the real person before they go on stage. They are the same when they're on, but, you know, it's a heightened sense or exaggerated or, you know, truths are stretched or lies are made for the purpose of humour. But you get to see the real person before and after. That's the way I've always thought of it anyway. I've always thought it's quite a unique position to be in and, and kind of hung about. But, Bobby, great question, man. To go back to it, if I could do it, QI, Stephen Fry as a host, would, be, would have been a fucking dream come true. And uh, if I had the opportunity to bring someone along with me, um, you know, to further their career as well, 100% mate, I would have done that, 100%. Uh, who that would be, I don't know, I'd need ever think. <laughs> I'd want to know what I was getting, listen man, I want £40 cash off you if I'm going to give them your name. <laughs> Good question man, absolutely brilliant question. So you go mate, aye. QI. Mock the week, uh, I've no, I, I think... Back in the day when obviously Frankie was on it, it was good. Uh, but now I have no watched Mock the Week in years. I don't even know if it's still going. Um, another thing that's probably just dragged itself across the line and has, has died a death, you know, and maybe needed revamped about fucking five, six years ago. But also, the, the you know, we'll not go too deep into how the, the comedy industry is in the UK, but it's, you know, a lot of the people who are coming through shouldn't have been near a television. You know, there was a time when that was the the pinnacle, you know, you worked towards that. If you got TV stuff, you were considered to be one of the good ones. Now it's, you know, agencies or, or, or connections. And there's a lot of people who are on that who, you know, just, in my opinion, just no funny. But hey, that's another conversation for another day. And again, you can't let these things consume you because it turns you better. You focus on your own stuff and you move on. And that is why we're always focused on live comedy, because that's the way it should be enjoyed. Bobby, thanks for the question, mate. Andrew, brilliant. And uh, Andrew Ward, good questions, boys. Thank you so much. Those guys asked that uh, through the Patreon. They are rascals on the Patreon page, and they get access to the episode that goes out every Friday as well, if you'd like to do that. And simply go to patreon.com forward slash Big Scott Gibson, or go to the website and uh, check out all the links there. Right. That's us. Uh, nice wee episode. Blow, uh, blitz through that one. Should say there's a couple of gigs coming up, unless Nicola announces tonight that we're locked in till fucking Pancake Day. Uh, October 24th. I am in Oban at The View in Oban. Cannot wait for that gig. Uh, tickets are still available, either from my website, from C Tickets, or directly from uh, The View in Oban. Uh, October 25th in Glasgow is sold out. That is the rearranged gig from September. Um, again, if you had tickets to the show on the 20th of September, do not worry. Those have been automatically transferred to October 25th. Uh, and last, we have November 6th at the Bungalow in Paisley. Uh, last count, there was 10 tickets left for that. So go ahead and snap up those last 10 tickets and let's uh, sell that one out. So those are the gigs coming up. October 24th, The View in Oban. October 25th, Classic Run in Glasgow. And November 6th, The Bungalow in Paisley. Go to the website, check them out, get your tickets, and uh, come along and see us do some live comedy, man. Should be good. Right, team, that's us. Thank you for listening to another episode. If you can, please share it. Um, stick in your socials. Get in touch. Give me your questions. Give me your topics. And uh, whatever happens in the updates, make sure you stay safe. Wash your hands. <laughs> I need to get this into a t-shirt or something or a mug wash your hands and your arsehole and I'll see you in a battlefield soon onwards <laughs>